Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Cheryl Harding. I am with James L. West Center for Dementia Care in Fort Worth. Um, I have been in this industry serving long-term care, senior living, older adults for about 30 years. Um, partly, part of my time was out in West Texas and then, of course, Central Texas, North Central Texas. Um, I have the opportunity also to teach. And so I teach, I've taught at several universities just at, as an adjunct, and I'm currently teaching at TCU. Uh, and fortunately, teaching a class to nursing students about older adults. And so it's really an introductory class and exposing them to uh, what it would be like to work with older adults. So I'm super excited to be able to do that. And I'm glad to be here to just share today some leadership tips. Okay, are y'all ready for me to go ahead and start? Yes, ma'am. All right, okay. Well, today um, I was asked just to share some um, thoughts on leadership and maybe some uh, ways to improve your leadership skills and to develop your own staff. Um, and I think that, you know, we can't ignore the workforce challenges. And I, I think the that uh, healthcare and long-term care had health uh, workforce challenges prior to COVID and it's just been exasperated. So we are going to talk about workforce challenges and what some of those are, as well as why leaders need to be able to talk about or to develop themselves and to adapt to today's market because it is very different than a few years ago. And then how to build cohesive and strong teams. So next. So I just wanted to share some of the um, stats on workforce challenges. We have all heard about them. We've all seen them. And uh, of course we know that uh, COVID exasperated it. Um, the stats are overwhelming sometimes to look at, but, uh, you know, I, everywhere I turn articles or uh, conferences, everywhere there's, there's sessions on workforce development and the challenges that we're, we're facing. And so I was recently at a conference in St. Louis for the home care and hospice industry, and they're talking about the same things we're talking about in long-term care. Uh, some of the titles of the sessions that they had, I just thought you might find interesting. Uh, one was the staffing shortages, a perspective from a CNA and a CEO. So that was very interesting. Um, your organizational culture, what is the human experience? Empowering our clinical man managers, of course, because we, we expect clinical managers to do a great job at their clinical skills. Uh, and then we throw them into leadership positions where they also need to have those leadership skills. And sometimes we don't provide the training that they need. Um, Valuing the caregiver population, there was a lot of talk about how do we provide more respect and value to our CNAs and nurses and other long-term care uh, clinical providers. So just knowing that those are, you know, really important topics that we're talking about every day and everywhere, just, and I won't read all these statistics to you, but you see that nursing homes, assisted livings, home cares, we're all challenged with finding uh, the right staff. Doctors as well, you know, geriatricians are a huge demand and we have a shortage of geriatricians as well. So <clears throat> as we look at more, and you can go next, please, uh, look at some more stats here, CNAs, you know, we all talk, there's a lot of talk about CNAs and how we recruit those CNAs to the field or back to the field because many of them left during COVID. Um, and they can go work down the street, you know, at, at a fast food place for as much as most places pay them. And so there's a really um, multi-level issues with recruiting CNAs. So better pay, of course, we see that as a stat that 84% liked what they were doing. They just need to have better pay to support their families. Um, and this one, it was astounding to me. 17% of CNAs live below the poverty line compared to 9% of other American workers. So they're not even as well off as other workers throughout the United States. And that's really a shame. Um, and we'll talk a lot about respect and recognition and how to uh, be provide better support. So next. <clears throat> so RNs are no exception or nurses in general, but uh, there was a study too that looked specifically at RNs. Uh, one of their biggest complaints was streamlined processes in their workplace. Well, you know, who's responsible for that? Obviously the leader is responsible for setting those processes and developing those positive workplaces, but, you know, the frustrations that they saw with having to uh, work in a healthcare setting that was disorganized was very stressful to them. And 
was one of the things that they wanted. They wanted better communication and they want open communication to their leaders. And we're going to talk a little bit like about that, that you as a leader, you must be available to your team and be able to um, communicate with them and be, be available for them to come to you with issues. Next. <clears throat> So here are just a few of the things that, a few of the reasons that people leave and uh, for healthcare, leave their jobs, burnout. We know we've heard a lot about that, especially after COVID, but believe it or not, that was a primary reason that healthcare providers or workers left their profession prior to COVID was burnout and mental, mental health challenges. Um, <clears throat> as you think about working in a healthcare setting, especially a hospital or a nursing home, it's stressful. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of ex things expected of a clinician. And with staffing shortages, it really makes that even more challenging. So they uh, really listed that multiple times that burnout and mental health was a, um, an issue. Of course, physically demanding for any of these, it's also very physically demanding. Uh, the people that were taken care of in hospitals and nursing centers and assisted living, they're sicker than they used to be. So, you know, we're, we're seeing people that are further along in the process before they call in for help. So it's very uh, challenging for healthcare workers. 39% said they had an increase in serious mental health, or in, which are mostly anxiety and depression, which is tough. All right. So uh, and other reasons work uh, retirement. So we saw, especially during COVID, we saw a lot of our older nurses and older employees retire, take early retirement, uh, go to a remote easier to do job. Maybe they went to more of administrative jobs, but a lot of them retired. Uh, income and pay, we know that that's a huge one. And even though during COVID, agency workers, nurses, and CNAs and stuff drove the salaries up, we made a huge salary adjustment at James O. West, and that has helped, but it still isn't enough. And so we really have to work toward getting better uh, pay and benefits for our healthcare workers and, and all the other things that go along with making a better workplace. A lot of them left because left the workforce because they it made more sense for them to stay home with their children than to pay for childcare because of the cost of childcare. So many nurses and CNAs that I know have multiple jobs to make ends meet, and that is a shame. So, all right. So uh, the under non uh, rewarding and undervalued. You know, we've talked about that a lot. We went from if you think about when COVID started, we went from healthcare heroes to all of a sudden we were firing people for not getting the vaccine. So we went from heroes to we don't need you anymore. And so there's a lot of in the literature about that, uh, uh, really disheartening to the healthcare profession that they were treated that way. And there's a lot that you hear about that. Um, desire for growth. I think that is under um, stated. I think that having career ladders and education programs and Ways for people to promote within their organization is so important. Uh, they want to grow. You know, a lot of folks want to improve and grow. And so I think that we have to, as employers, recognize that. And as leaders, look for ways to develop our staff in that way. Uh, organizational culture. And I find that one interesting because um, there's just so much. That's such a huge topic. But again, who is, who is capable of making that change in your organization? It's us. It's leaders. So we have to be the best leader we can in order to make those changes. One article I read I thought was interesting was talking about what we call our healthcare professionals. So we talk about CNAs all the time, right? Um, and we know that other professions like physician assistants prefer, prefer to be called a physician associate. You know, they don't want to be called a mid-level mid or a extender. They want to be called an associate. Um, we talk about long-term care and not talking about facilities, but talk about communities. So one of the things this article suggested is that we call CNAs what they really are, and that's a professional caregiver. So we know they are caring and providing professional care. So let's think about how we, as leaders, influence the public and kind of change that paradigm of what we think about our caregivers. All right, next. All right, so how can we as leaders make a difference? Well, I thought these were three interesting quotes. Um, Peter Drucker, who everyone knows, he's a great leader, but uh, this spoke to me that only three things happen naturally in an organization, friction, confusion, and underperformance. Everything else requires leadership. So we are the ones who have to make that difference. Um, and I think that 
as we look to make that difference, we have to not only improve ourselves, but improve our direct reports. Um, LinkedIn had a, 19, a 2018 work study that said 93% would stay at their company longer if the company invested in their careers. That's pretty significant. So I know we face huge turnover at James O. West, and we look for ways to invest in them, but obviously we need to do a better job. Next. <clears throat> So I wanted to share with you some of my favorite resources that I have used throughout the years um, for leadership development of myself as well as my team. And some of these I've used with my teams and saw great um, outcomes. And so, you know, these are tried and true classic type um, resources that you could try as well. I know there's lots of new ones as well, but I thought I would highlight the classics. Um, so, you know, what these all have in common <clears throat> Every one of these resources that I'll share have get to know your staff, know them, know who they are and how they work and how they learn and how they communicate, but also collaborative, honest, authentic leadership is what they want. And that's what we need to be developing as well. So we, they deserve and need honest and frequent feedback. You'll see uh, and all these resources talk about um, improving job satisfaction for your leaders, making sure that you're communicating effectively, that today's workplace is much more complex and challenging to manage. And so, you know, we have to pivot with that. And so in long-term care, I think it's interesting because, and Jay may be a, able to agree with this, but, you know, it's very much a top-down industry, always has been. The administrator's the boss, everybody else gets in line and you're told what to do. Well, well that's changing, thankfully. Uh, and I know a lot of my cohorts have changed that, Jay being one, that you've got to have collaborative leadership and not be the boss, which has been historically the long-term care expectation. Um, so anyway, some of these tools will help help develop that as we look at, you know, even um, how to be resilient in this workplace. So management styles, know your team. There's There are tons of ways to measure yourself as well as having your team measure themselves so that you know their management style. So I've just listed a few here that are, um, you know, classics. There's lots of other ones, uh, the colors and all those things, but you can it really work to get to know your management team. And I think that some people shy away from those things because they're a little intimidating, but I think if you use them as a group discussion and a way to help your team talk to each other better, and you know, communicate and know what each other's strengths and, and all those things are, I think that is really helpful. Um, another is the emotional intelligence. So there's a book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. It's by Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves. And it really is a great book. And I've used it several times in several different settings with my teams. And it really helps you understand your own self and your emotional intelligence but also in a team setting to be able to share with each other and talk about strengths and areas you can improve. It, it really develops your self-awareness, um, your self-management, your relationship management, and it allows you to do a pre and a post test. So you can measure your uh, emotional intelligence, do the book, do the discussions with your team, and then measure it again to see <clears throat> how you might have improved. My teams that I've used it with have always loved it. And, um, and most of the time I've seen improvement with the teams and their communication and their ability to work together better. Um, I have to tell you, it doesn't always work. And I do have one really sad example. I had a wonderful leader who had excellent skills, excellent skills in her field. I could not get her improved in this area. And I, and I thought it was, you know, odd, but you've got to be willing to change, right? You've got to be willing to embrace it. But it was unfortunate because we ended up having to part ways with her because of her lack of emotional intelligence and her lack of ability to work with the team. So I think this is a great way to develop your team, though. I really do think that it's a great book, and I would encourage you, everybody, it's a quick read and a great way to discuss it with your teams. Next. <clears throat> so this is another thing that I, th I find interesting. We refer to Maslow's hierarchy a lot throughout life and all the other things we do. Well, here's one that is really uh, a work workplace um, Maslow's hierarchy. So how does your organization look compared to this? So if you look, you know, we, we all, most of us provide the basic benefits, the insurance, the pay, 
maybe we give them a meal credit or we, you know, James OS, we provide a very discounted employee meal. <clears throat> but, and then safety, you know, we all try and work to provide a safe work environment. I know there are places that, that maybe don't have that uh, or maybe don't provide the resources a person needs. But one of the, <clears throat> when I first came to James OS, um, and really working in the nonprofit field, as long as I have, I really haven't worked on the other side much. But, you know, fortunately, I've always been able to provide my staff with the tools they need to do their job. And I think that's one of the biggest areas of uh, satisfaction. So in talking to uh, CNAs and our employee orientation over the years, <clears throat> you know, that's one of the biggest things they say is I just want to make sure I've got briefs and I've got gloves and I've got all these things that I need to do my job because when I don't, then I fail. And I also get really frustrated to the fact that I, I'm having to make do. So I think that is a really important one, which I believe falls into safety. <clears throat> Throughout COVID, that was a big issue. Were we all able to provide the PPE we needed to our staff? No, we had people reusing N95s for weeks. Um, we had them, you know, James O. West, we had little brown paper bags and they hung them up every day when they left to go home for work because we couldn't get enough masks. That's a huge dissatisfier uh, that is still listed in some of the literature that I saw for nurses, especially. <clears throat> so, you know, the social level, are we able to um, have good relations and professional associations at work? Well, we do the Gallup poll satisfaction survey. We do a satisfaction survey every, every six months. <clears throat> One of the things that is the most important indicator of work for, work, workforce, uh, workplace satisfaction is having a friend at work. So it was interesting because we measured that and we didn't do very well. And so <clears throat> we went back to some of the staff and said, you know, you answered that in a negative way or did you, you know, because it's anonymous, so we really don't know. But we talked to some of the groups and said, what did that mean to you when we asked you that? Well, it was funny because they interpreted it as somebody I see on the weekends and at night and, you know, we hang out with their husbands and, you know, we, we have family events together. That's really not what it means. So we went back to the Gallup poll and said, what exactly, you know, how can we define this for our staff? So we, we made sure before the next uh, survey to let them know what the question was really asking. So the question is really asking, do you have somebody at work that you might eat lunch with or that you might share what you did over the weekend? Not that you hung out with them all weekend, but you might say, hey, I went to the zoo or, you know, something like that. So that's really what it meant. It was really more, it's really more of a, um, just a workplace relationship, not necessarily inferring that you hang out with this person on the weekends. So once we made sure they understood the definition, then obviously we scored better <laughs> on our next survey. But uh, that is one of the Gallup poll biggest indicators of satisfaction is a friend at work. <clears throat> then you move up the um, pyramid, you got esteem, you know, so people want to be proud of what they are and who they are. And I think that goes back to that whole CNA title, what we call them. We call them CNAs. Maybe we need to change that to professional caregivers. You know, there's a lot of other terms well, like the greenhouse model has used Shabazz. Well, you know, those that didn't catch on necessarily in the long-term care field, but what are some things that we could do as leaders in our industry to make that different? Um, and then of course, to be able to reach the top peak of the self-actualization is advancement, career opportunities, having a challenging job, something that you're proud of, something that you get meaning from. So I think this is a great tool just to kind of self-evaluate your organization and see what you need to do to improve. Next. <clears throat> So many of these, the rest, all of the models talk about trust and influence and authenticity and how to um, walk along beside your leaders, not boss them, not direct them, but develop them alongside you and be a mentor. So situational leadership is a model. It was developed in the 60s, <clears throat> excuse me, by Paul Hershey, and it's been used throughout you know, thousands of corporations and work settings and things. But the premise of the whole situational leadership model is that you're walking aside your leader, that you are, and I love the, uh, you're using a common sense approach. It, you know, that was kind of how it's been described since the 60s is organized common sense. Well, we know common sense is not that common anymore, but um, but we, we do want organized common sense when we can, right? So, 
um, as as a, using the situational leadership model, there's tons of training. You can go to their website. There's tons of training that you can do for an individual, for your team, <clears throat> whatever. And it's very affordable and, and great, a great way to access it online and all that. But um, but it really stresses that authenticity of the leader, trust, being candid in your feedback, um, walking alongside them, developing them, first knowing them, you got to first know them, uh, and then responding to how they need you to respond, not them responding to you. But you have to be able to know your leaders <clears throat> and and respond to them. So that's really the premise of the um, of the situational leadership, the um, purpose uh, items that are listed from the book or from the training program is the to enhance the leader, me, uh, to maximize the performance of each of my team. So it's my responsibility to do that, to figure out who they are and maximize their performance. It's my job to build trust with my team. It's my job to produce uh, or to promote their creativity and, and allow them to be creative and enjoy their role and improve communication, improve outcomes, uh, and be clear in your expectations. So that, that's a great training module. I would suggest that any of you uh, that need that go ahead and look at it. Another, you can go next. <clears throat> Another one is the, I love this book. This is, it's been around a long time, the new One Minute Manager. So the original book was the One Minute Manager, and it was produced or published in 1982 by Ken Blanchard and Spencer Johnson. Well, <clears throat> They decided that the workforce is changing and that things have to move more rapid and you have to respond quicker. And, you know, we have more challenges. And that was in 2015 when they did that. So they produced the new one minute manager, um, which they could probably do another version now after COVID, right? Because workplace has changed again. But, uh, but this new one minute manager does address um, pivoting quicker, being able to respond quicker to needs and uh, a, a very collaborative approach to management. So it's a real interesting book, real easy read for your team. I've done it with teams as well. It's really told through a parable about a young man that wants to learn about leadership skills. And uh, he goes from leader to leader to try to figure out what makes them successful. Um, and so he really finds out that there are two types of leaders, results oriented, who are tough, you know, authoritarian type leaders, and people-oriented leaders that may not be so successful with their outcomes, but they're good with people. So he wanted to find a better way. Well, the in the One Minute Manager, <clears throat> the, um, the point is to, the three things that you should do is set goals with your staff. So that sitting down with them, finding out what their needs are and what they want to accomplish and what you want them to accomplish for your organization. Set goals, write them down, review them regularly. And then One Minute Praises. I think that's a really an area that we all could be better at and that's finding them doing something right and being sure to praise them and keep it keep it to a minute make it quick you did a great job yesterday thank you for doing that you know those kinds of things be specific about what they did great and then the third is one minute reprimands so <clears throat> there are times you're gonna find people doing things that are not in line with your vision or your core values or even your policies so at that point then you would want to make a one minute reprimand which is just identifying the fact. It's not personal. It's not about the person. Identify the fact quickly, confirm the facts, and then give direction. And so you're not focusing on the person at all. You're just focusing on the fact of what, what is needed to be improved. So, and then move on. And as far as you're concerned as a leader, once it's addressed, you're expecting it not to ever happen again. And so you move on and you don't talk about it anymore. So that's really the premise of that new one minute manager. It's a great book. I would recommend it uh, for anyone. And then Discovering Your True North, that's a personal favorite of mine. And I have not used that with a leadership team, but but I've used it for myself a lot. Um, and it's really just finding your leadership purpose. And um, really, it's an intimate discovery of your own personal leadership style, identifying your own personal core values, and just making sure that you know your true north so that you can be authentic. So I love that book, and I would encourage everybody to read that if you haven't. Um, really, you're it's you're learning how to be a servant leader, and we've heard a lot about servant leadership leadership over the years, and that's a great thing to strive for. So uh, we've all known <clears throat> leaders who weren't so great, 
And so I, I was going to name some that were named in the in the book and see if you if anybody comes to mind. Uh, an imposter, a rationalizer, a glory seeker, a loner, or a shooting star. We probably all know people that come to mind when we read some of those. I and mean, that's what we're not striving for. We're really looking to be authentic and to uh, motivate others to their full potential. Uh, Self-awareness is you got to know yourself. If you don't know yourself, how can you lead others? So that's really a big part of the True North book. Um, let's see. You can advance. There you go. So let's talk a little bit, you know, real world applications. So we want to be able to take some of these things and see how we've applied them to our to ourselves and to our workplace. And I think that um, I'll just share a few of mine at, at James O. West. Uh, we have really put a focus on workforce development in the last five years, and we have done some things specifically, but culture is a big part of it, trying to develop a um, accepting, inclusive um, growth type uh, environment. And so some of the ways that we've done that is, and James O.S. has said clinical rotations there for years, but we've just tried to expand our clinical rotations for people that come in to see James O.S. and to learn. And so we have many, many disciplines that come in to do that. You know, develop relationships with universities. You really want to make a difference to tomorrow's leaders. Develop relationships with high schools and universities. Have those students come to your organization and show them what culture, what a healthy culture looks like. And so, um, it, but we also work really hard to make sure our employees know what we're doing and that they know they're part of the, the uh, training of that future workforce development. So whenever we have students, when we did have a lot of students that come in, and sometimes the staff are like, oh, not another group of students, but we try to encourage them to see it as their, their ability to influence others and to help grow those leaders that might take care of them one day. And so we... Um, really work hard to include them in the leadership and the training and the mentoring role that we want to have there. You know, we partner with UNT at Health Science Center and um, NTCU Medical Schools, and they do clinicals and rounds through James O. West, but they, we also have worked to develop a uh, dementia elective for the TCU Medical School. So we'll be offering that next year, and Dr. Knabe will be helping us with that. Um, of course, we have licensed nursing facility administrators come through for their AIT training. We have currently have two doctoral students that reached out to us just because we have made it a point to have relationships with the universities. And we have a, you know, our service agreements with several universities throughout uh, for all their departments, not just one. But we recently had a doctoral nursing student reach out to us and ask, could she do uh, a process improvement research project for us as one of her class uh, needs? And so she'll be starting in the spring to work with our DON to identify a clinical process that needs improvement. She'll do research on it and then make her recommendations. So we're excited about that. We also have an OT student that is a doctoral student at TWU. And she is going to be starting in the spring as well. And she will be um, doing a needs assessment for our adult day program and then identifying uh, additional services that we could wrap around our day program because we're wanting to make it more than just a, a day stay. So uh, that's a, two exciting projects that we have coming up that you know, they reached out to us because they knew we were an inclusive um, collaborative type organization. Uh, of course, we have a CNA school and we started that a few years ago and we actually develop our own CNAs. And we work with our staff to know that they're part of that teaching process, that if they want us to have great teammates, then they help us develop those CNAs. And so that's been exciting and very successful. We are currently teaching a CNA class for Fort Worth ISD. They're junior level students that are in their P-TECH school. And this is our first year to do it, and it's um, going well. And those students will be doing clinicals at James L. West in the spring, too. So we'll have a whole slew of um, high school students doing their clinicals at James O. West. Um, but in, as far as our in-house um, development of our team and providing them growth opportunities and the ability to better themselves, <clears throat> we uh, created a list of the top 25 reasons to work at James O. West. And we have that posted all over the community. So we came up with, you know, not, all, not just all the benefits and stuff, of course, all those are listed too, but we have a scholarship we have a career ladder, you know, we have ways for people to become better. 
And uh, I was walking through um, the other day and a new employee came in talking to her and introduced myself. And she had just joined us as a brand new nurse, but she had done her clinicals for, at James O. West. That's why she came back. So she also knew that there were lots of opportunities for growth there too. So we were excited to see that. Um, we do allow flex time to pursue education. We have scholarship programs. Um, so it's really, it's really about telling your story to your employees, uh, to the workforce, to the community, to you know, wider audiences, to make sure they know that there are great reasons to work for your organization, but in long-term care as well. So what are some reasons that people are, what are some things you're doing in your organization to develop the workforce? You know, because it's really important that you be able to continue to develop if we're gonna have people take care of us, right? So again, on the slides I have, you know, some of the things I've already talked about, being authentic, investing in yourself as a leader, and that's lifelong learning, not just a few times. Uh, next, <clears throat> creating a great culture for your workforce. Um, of course, you want to have tangible benefits and pay. And, and at James O. West, we do a wage study every six months to make sure we're with the market and that we haven't got left behind because we did get left behind one time and it hurt us pretty bad. It quickly hurt us. And so uh, we do stay up with wages and things like that. Next. That's it. So I, I hope that I've given you some ideas to, um, to think about in your own development, but in developing your teams. And I have, um, you know, some ideas that I'm going to start in the spring with my team. And we're going to do some of these classics uh, together as a team. But we're also going to look for some new other resources as well. So it's just a, it's constant. And especially with all the turnover we see, you just have to constantly be developing and, and training to be able to keep people. Um, so that's all I've got. I thank y'all for your um, for your attention. If you have any questions, you can let me know now.